Shadow of Destiny, or Shadow of Memories as it was known in the UK, and pronounced in Japan as Shadow Obu Memorizu. Okay. Was a 2001 PlayStation 2 game published by Konami and developed by Konami Computer Entertainment Tokyo about a man using time travel powers to circumvent his own murder. It was back in the day when Konami made good games like Silent Hill, Boktai, Zone of the Enders, the Metal Gear Solid series, that sort of thing. You know, before the dark times. It's actually a really hard game to find out more behind the scenes interview types of information, primarily because it shares the word destiny in the title, which, as you can imagine, makes researching this game difficult. Even Wikipedia itself refuses to have the header reflect the game's American name. So even though the internet insists on referring to it as Shadow of Memories, that's not what the box says, so that's not what I'm gonna call it. The title screen does a good job of establishing the tone of the game, with a creepy music box melody playing primarily. What's also interesting is that when you choose to load a save file, the music crossfades into a super eerie theremin variation that gives it a haunting vibe, which eventually loops into the game's leitmotif theme song thing. The story centers around a blonde, green tunic-wearing guy named Ike Kush, who is presumed to be German and residing in a small European village, despite having a perfect American accent, living his best life before he gets stabbed in the back and left in the street to die. He wakes up in a room suspended in time and space before he hears a disembodied voice explaining the situation to him, that he's dead and he can go back in time to prevent it. The disembodied voice here is actually an extremely famous individual in the video game voiceover world, but I'll let you listen to him for a bit longer before I'll tell you who it is, so keep guessing. How does it feel to be dead, right? Damn it, who is this? Are you making fun of me? <laughs> Not at all. I beg your pardon if I've offended you. You are strongly fated today. You see, you are destined to die. What? Ike's voice actor and delivery, on the other hand, is incredibly funny in a so-bad-it's-good way, primarily because he's a baritone who constantly tries to sound like an optimistic alto, as you'll see throughout the game. A lot of people say it's bad, but there's something incredibly fitting about his performance. If it was done any differently, I don't think the game would have had the same charm. Why? Can't you trust me? Of course not. I get it. You're the big S, the devil. Oh hey guys, it's me, Satan, also known as The Big S. That line always gets me more than the classic Resident Evil 4 line, The, the Big Cheese. I'm sorry I called you the devil. I don't want to die yet. Ike is given a small passport-sized device called a digipad that allows him to travel through time instantly, with the small caveat that it can only be used at specific times when it glows green, usually signaled by a brief cutscene in which Ike looks at the device while it goes... And with that, he's off on his stressful chore of self-preservation. The gameplay is literally just walking around different time periods and talking to certain characters at specific times. But holy Moses, I can't help but love what it accomplishes. And after asking my humbly-sized Twitter following if they've ever heard of it and realizing it's considered a very niche game, I decided more people could stand to know about it. It's not horribly expensive if you wanted to buy it for yourself on PS2, with the game later being ported to PC with horribly wonky controls with no possibility for rebinding keys. And it was also re-released on PSP in 2009, albeit with a mostly replaced voice cast that removes a lot of the cheesy goodness from the original. But if you wanted to play it yourself before hearing my video, then those are your options. I really hated the PSP port, because they replaced Ike's voice actor with anime pretty boy Yuri Lowenthal. And if you've seen my Evil Within video, you know I have a bone to pick with that decorated fuck. Uh, thanks, but no thanks. Sounds too good to be true. Why? Why? Can't you trust me? Of course not. Look, I get it. You're the evil one, the devil. In exchange for your immortal soul and all that, am I right? Ike is voiced by a man known as Scott Keck, whose only other notable role has been Mitsurugi from Soul Calibur 2. You win. Your name's Mitsurugi. Remember it! He also did a good job in this silly animated short called Less Than Human, in which he voices a reporter with a bias against zombies. And if you listen, you can totally tell it's him. Recently, there's been talk about the rights of these so-called cured ones. And some humanitarian organizations are even arguing that maybe the time for reintegration has arrived. What? 
I'll be covering some other voice actor trivia throughout the game, but I'll keep it short. I just find it interesting. But yeah, I really love this game despite its many flaws. And I wish it got a sequel because it's a really impressive example of what video games can accomplish as a medium. And I've yet to find another game with an interactive branching story that entertains me quite as much. So yeah, I'm gonna be poking fun at it, but I really, really love this game. Did I mention I love this game? Let's continue. Ike wakes up to the sight of a cute blonde waitress waking him up as he seemed to pass out in a diner before he becomes flustered and leaves the money for his coffee on the table. He steps outside and eventually stumbles upon the building of a nearby fortune teller who explains to him that he'll die relatively soon and how to evade his demise, along with a forecast of your inevitable time of death. Ike's voice acting in this scene made me immediately fall in love with his sincerity. He just sounds so naive and vulnerable. Welcome. I've been expecting you. <laughs> Actually, I just happened to stop by, and I was wondering if you could tell me my fortune. Am I going to die soon? For you, I will do it for free. Thanks. I really need this. Please, don't just give me the usual niceties. This is very serious for me. Don't worry. Learning he has to get a crowd together to deter the killer, he travels back in time earlier that day to gather the local gossips, whom you'll learn to love yet hate as the plot advances, due in part to their incredibly nasally, pompous voices and negative temperament. I have to keep an eye on my daughter, or she just runs off! You want me to come to the square at 2.30? What's going to happen in the square? A performer, maybe? Well, all right. I don't have anything else to do anyway. Have you seen my mother? Okay. Guess I'll go to the square. They consist of two wrinkled old shrews that have seen one too many divorces, and a little girl with a permanent scowl emblazoned on her face. Ike lies and tells them there will be a performer in the square, and upon returning to the present, a white-cloaked juggler mysteriously appears, as Ike comments, Hey, now here's a guy with no worries. The killer is seen approaching from behind before backing off, as Ike realizes his close call. There was someone behind me! Oh, but it looks like the crowd scared him off. This game understandably fits within the adventure genre, but I've always thought of it as being a horror game. Mostly psychological horror, anyway. You don't fight any monsters or witness any horrible abominations, unless you count this guy. But there's a lot of fear and tension present everywhere in the game. You have a timer that's constantly counting down, and if you aren't in your original time period when you're supposed to be murdered, you simply cease to exist. There are a number of ways to reach this fail state, but the easiest one is when you encounter your sleeping self in the diner and attempt to make physical contact. Oh, that's oh, just that's wonderful. wonderful. You tried to you make tried contact to make with contact yourself, yourself, didn't you? Didn't you? That's, a big, that's no a big no no. That will erase, erase your very your existence. existence. Be careful Be next careful time. time. Life is a wheel of changes. I just love that sound effect. It's so genuinely terrifying to hear that loud, reverb-heavy scream before you're ripped out of existence. Alternatively, when the clock is counting down, it'll do a slow tick once per second as the screen pulsates with a green hue. It's not inherently scary on its own since you pretty much get unlimited retries. But the spookiest part for me was trying to remember how much time I have left and hoping the cutscenes which eat up a certain chunk of time wouldn't end in my death. It's actually incredibly easy to lose track of the time of your death, which constantly shifts forward in each chapter. This is often aided by the sped up sound of the clock that lets you know you just lost a decent chunk of time. The game will try to prompt you to get out of there before the time is up by having Ike look at his digipad with startled body language. But oftentimes it's too late, and you'll simply die anyway if it happens at the end of a long cutscene. What am I... what am I supposed to do? There used to be something in here. If I get some...
On top of that, the soundtrack gets really eerie the more you play the game. There's a lot of basic wind and string instrumentation in the soundtrack, like the oboe and pizzicato strings to emphasize the lurking, creepy nature of knowing you're being watched and followed as you try to figure out the identity of your assailant. These tracks really help set the mood for paranoia, and at times it almost feels like some of the other NPCs are conspiring to kill you as well, thanks in part to the mystery man and mystery woman who are always shifting locations throughout the game, trying to make contact with one another. They're never once explained or given any backstory, simply that they're looking for that man or that woman. I'm pretty sure this is just a really tactless attempt at a drug deal. There's probably the dankest cush in that suitcase. Anyway, the prologue ends and chapter one begins, with a nearby bar engulfed in flames, as a teenage boy pleads with Ike to rescue his family member. Some of the nearby townsfolk from earlier will show concern at the blazing inferno, but two NPCs don't seem to be affected too much by this. <laughs> Jeez, I don't think anybody can make it out of that mess. Cool! Look at that thing burn! <laughs> Upon going inside, he immediately passes out from smoke inhalation and dies, realizing he needs to find the fire's origin point and snuff it out before it spreads. As he does so, he sees someone fleeing from the scene of the crime, but opts to prioritize the flames instead. It took me years to realize that it's actually also possible to enter the burning building, travel back in time, travel forward to the burning building, and then travel back in time again so that you're locked inside the bar, go down into the basement, and alert the sleeping bar owner that there's a fire. And after some justified skepticism, the old man realizes as you're telling the truth and takes care of the fire himself. As he thanks you and you begin to depart, you have the most surreal conversation that feels less like an intentional gag and more like a glitch in the cutscene script. Say, by the way, do you happen to have grandchildren? Mm hmm, sure do, a grandson and a granddaughter, twins. They've just started walking, just adorable. You wanna see the picture? <laughs> no thanks, but I'm sure they're really cute. Absolutely. They're the apple of my eye. Want to see the picture? Oh, that's okay. Anyway, see you later. All right. See ya. Like, why did he ask twice in the exact same delivery if Ike wants to see the pictures? And why did Ike respond both times like it was the first time he heard the question? I just imagine the developer was approached by the scriptwriter with two different drafts of the dialogue, and they said, eh, fuck it, just cram them together, no one will notice. Ike travels back to the present as the blazing inferno Gaussian blurs into non-existence, before reflecting on the fact that his actions really do carry weight. Chapter 2 begins with Ike being pursued by the waitress, who woke him up at the start of the prologue, identifying herself as Dana, before asking him if he left behind a mysterious red stone that doesn't actually belong to him, thereafter giving him back his lighter that he forgot at the diner. Almost immediately after the conversation ends, it's revealed that someone is watching Ike from the nearby tree and promptly murders him in front of Dana. And everyone else. Wasn't this guy supposed to be useless in crowds? What about all these other people hanging out in the square? Did they just not notice him keel over or hear Dana screaming? Interesting logic the game has here. <laughs> Ike tries again and realizes he has the opportunity to travel back in time to the early 1900s. And when he does, Dana accidentally gets warped along with him. If you move the control stick to try and prevent this, Dana stops you, as her teleportation is important to the story. Dana's voice actress, Julie Parker, voiced Talum from Soul Calibur 2. I can't let you go on. The sword is evil. As well as apparently Super Smash Bros. Ultimate English version voice. I guess she just voiced the entire game, nothing to see here. We get some Groundhog Day antics should the player choose to die again, as Ike will begin finishing her sentences and start to freak her out. Uh, look, if it's about the red stone, it isn't mine. What? Maybe you checked with the other customers, but in any case, that stone isn't mine, Dana. You've got a lost lighter tucked away in there. How did you know that? Tell me, this is kind of creepy. Don't you feel like you've met me before? Is it the red stone? What? It isn't mine, but can you let me have a look? What? Uh, uh well, sure. I might. You're Dana, right? Y yes but how... I heard your boss calling you back there. Here you go. Uh, okay. Oh, and that lighter's mine? What? How did you know that? Tell me. This is kind of creepy. Well, I have my methods. You don't mean like you can see through clothing and stuff? Actually, yeah. What? As if. No, it's just a hunch. No tricks. 
Regardless, Ike needs to go back in time and remove the tree so the killer has nowhere to hide, even though it would be much easier to just um, ask Dana to move away from the tree and continue the conversation elsewhere. But I guess the story needs to happen, so... You get teleported to the late 1500s, in which everything is sepia tone, and you witness a young woman being harassed by the ancestral gossips, who are meant to be the relatives of people from the present day. But it's extremely obvious that they were just saving time and money by reusing the same 3D models and voice actors. I mean, it works, it's just funny and kind of lazy. They shame her for her nice dress and demand she makes them dresses for free in exchange for them not snitching on her. Not sure why anyone cares that a girl wears a dress, but it was a different time, I guess. Political commentary. The game uses Ike's teleportation to jump scare the characters as well as the player mid-sentence. We're doing this just to be obliging. <laughs> Upon his appearance, the town guard rolls up with his lantern, with Ike's beautiful blue eyes unable to take the apparently blinding light. At this point, you're locked in place until you use an item. The player can use either the lighter to confuse the townspeople into thinking he has the ability to produce flames at the drop of a hat, but I always choose the cell phone, because Ike's description of the technology always makes me chuckle. If you do as I say, no harm will come to you. This time. If you don't, I'll use this machine on you. Ooh. I can trap any of you inside this box in an instant. Sweet savior! Imagine a big-ass Nokia cell phone scaring people. That's actually more accurate than anything it says on the back of the box. After scaring off the shriveled hags and their youngest soon-to-be shriveled hag, Margaret thanks you and asks you to come home with her, where she introduces you to her annoying little brother Hugo and her mortally bedridden mother Helena, with their father Wolfgang busy cooking up a cure for her in his basement laboratory. Hugo seems convinced from the get-go that you're from the future, and when he witnesses your digipad fall out of your pocket, he makes a few very interesting guesses. What is that? Uh, it's a machine. A really complicated one. It's, uh, well, I, I don't know how to explain it to you. Let me guess. It... It... Makes whatever dish you want appear? <laughs> no. Okay, that was just wishful thinking. Well, then... It maps the heavens? No, it doesn't do that. All right, then. It... I know! It lets you travel through time! Uh, and you've come from the future, am I right? Well, actually, uh... What? I'm right? How could that be? Uh, how is that possible? Ike also learns that Dr. Wagner needs a Philosopher's Stone to finish whatever he's working on. Also, I know it's pronounced Wagner, but I just think it's too funny that the voice talent did so many things wrong in this game, so I like to keep it consistent. I don't have a good reason, I just think it's funny. Hugo's talent, Jim Singer, voiced Yun 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 Sung in Soul Calibur 2. Do you seriously want to fight? All right, I'm itching for a fight. As well as the AI Simon from the VR game Raw Data. I expected him to sound like a shrill little kid in all of his roles, but he's either grown up since then, or he just has more range than I gave him credit for. Don't mention it about all the tours. It's cool. Maybe if you want to buy me lunch sometime. I don't know. No worries if not. Ike eventually talks to a gardener in the square, who explains that he's planting the tree on behalf of the squire. Ike trades a nearby gate guard a modern postcard of the town, in exchange for a key, because this guy is completely shit at his job. And upon seeing the squire's seal on the front of the building, he grabs a nearby ladder and uses it to retrieve the seal, which he presents to the gardener as some sort of authentication that he's a royal messenger, telling him that the squire wants something else planted in place of the tree. I like that he just believes him, because that's kind of like the modern day equivalent of stealing someone's license plate and being like, hey yeah, I'm him, G give me his money. I would always choose flowers over a statue, since the reasonable assumption in my head was always that you can't hide behind flowers, but you could totally hide behind a statue. But choosing the flowers option introduces a big stone pillar in the middle anyway. Regardless, both answers are correct and will prevent your assassination. But if you choose the statue, it will feature a jade iteration of Ike's likeness. And depending on whether you chose a lighter or a cell phone, he'll be holding a futuristic looking device or a handful of flames. Which is an interesting result that they went the extra mile to accomplish. Ike returns to the present and realizes he needs to continue looking for Dana, before he unfittingly pulls out a cigarette and subsequently decides... Today is a good day to quit. That's like putting on sunglasses just to take them off for dramatic effect. Especially since we've never seen him smoking any time in the game until now. 
The next chapter begins with Ike abruptly getting killed when a vase falls on his head. The point of this chapter isn't so much about preventing your own death, as much as it is about learning more about Dr. Wagner and the Philosopher's Stone that Dana was holding earlier. But the game's internal logic seems to be that Ike just happens to be curious about alchemy, so he goes to his local friend who owns a museum, Mr. Eckert, and gets a small book about an alchemist. He leaves and encounters the person who's been speaking to him as a disembodied voice, who identifies himself as homunculus. Also, if you haven't guessed who he is by now, he's voiced by Charles Martinet, the voice of Mario. Just let that sink in. I actually think this is his best performance to date. It's nice to hear him putting on a creepy voice for a change, to juxtapose all the child-friendly wahoos and mamma mias. Do you remember me now? I was the one who saved you. You should be a little more appreciative. What's going on around here? Who are you? That's not very nice. Can't you be a little more polite? I am homunculus. Not that there's much in a name. I've been waiting a long time to see you again. I've looked for you everywhere. By the way, are you using the digipad? Have you come here to kill me? Hmm? I think you misunderstand. I'm only trying to help you. Certainly not murder you. It's just that I don't know how to give you any direct help. And that's the truth. I think I'm going out of my mind. Homunculus tries talking to Ike to convince him that he's the one who gave him his time-traveling powers, but Ike doubts him, which has Homunculus sending Ike to the 1970s with no energy nodes to use in his digipad. As soon as you show up, you encounter a young Eckert who's excited about some news. <laughs> Oh gosh, didn't realize anyone was out here. Sorry about yelling and everything. It's okay, don't worry about it. You see, my wife finally had our baby, so you can imagine I... And it's a girl too, the hospital just called me. Wow, congratulations. Do you work at this museum? No, I'm, I'm sorry, my name is Eckert. I've just taken over from my father as the director of this museum. What? You're Mr. Eckert? Yes, is there... Is there anything I can do for you? No, nothing. Wait, what am I doing? <laughs> I have to think about what we're gonna call her! Hey, great to meet you. <laughs> Bye! Eventually, Ike finds an energy node and uses it to get back to the present, at which point Homunculus basically says, You believe me now, bitch? He goes back to Eckert's office, and after learning about Eckert supposedly having a baby girl, he asks, Mr. Eckert, do you have a daughter? It's all right. I'll take care of it later. I'm sorry. I do have a daughter. Or rather, I did. She was taken by some madman right after she was born. My wife was killed in the same attack. Does that answer your question? I'm sorry. I, I had no idea. It's okay. Don't worry about it. I'm so sorry. God damn it. As he leaves, Homunculus gives Ike a hint. As you can see, my body is very fragile and won't let me do much. I picked up a baby the other day and it was really quite terrible, absolutely exhausted me. I won't ever do that again. So because of all that, I can only provide you with some backup aid. Oh, I almost forgot. You will see that red stone again sometime. When you do, could you acquire it somehow? I would like you to give it to someone called Dr. Wagner. 
with Chapter 3 concluding, Chapter 4 begins with one of the coolest premises in the game. You're walking in the street when suddenly, surprise surprise, you die from a lethal dose of knife. You wake up and you're told you should look for something to block the knife. You go back in time to the mid-1900s and meet Eckert's great-grandfather, Alfred Broom, as well as his daughter Sibylla, who are celebrating the opening of their museum. Going back to the topic of reused character models, I think it's hilarious that they just took Eckert's model and slapped a big-ass mustache on him. And it's not even subtle facial hair. It looks like they just stapled a rotting apple slice to his upper lip. Alfred gets a little aggro when you know more than you should about his building. Maybe a good thing a museum. Perhaps this is meant to be. There are enough pictures in that collection of my forebears. It seems he had an artist he favored. You mean Carl Franson? How did you know that? Are you checking into this house? I don't remember telling anyone that it was for sale. No, please don't misunderstand. I like how he starts getting worked up and then turns away like, No, you know what? This fucker's getting slapped right now. It's just that I happen to like his paintings. And it's not like, uh, you know... All right, you live another day, pussy. When you first encounter Sibylla, she's tending to her sleeping little brother, who's actually Eckerd as a baby. And her voice is the worst thing in the entire game. Oop, sorry. He's just gone to sleep, finally. Hello, father. I notice you are trying to be quiet. I, however, will not be silenced. She's thankful that her father decided not to sell the house, and remembering that he needs to acquire a thick iron plate with which to prevent being skewered, Ike starts looking around before quietly asking, Isn't there an iron plate? You know, as one does. Sibylla doesn't have anything to give him, and as he tries to leave, she essentially rips off his jacket after noticing it has a tear in it, which frees him up to wear this convenient juggler outfit. And wouldn't you know, it looks pretty familiar. Along with this, she hands him a little egg-shaped scroll called a Scribner's Egg. He travels back to the present day and waits in the square, and upon seeing himself, throws him an egg which his original self reads out loud. Please, let it work. There's a letter inside. To Ike, please get something like a thick iron plate. What the? When he returns to the 1950s, he puts his normal clothes back on, and wouldn't you know it, he suddenly has a frying pan fallout. I guess 2001 Ike got the frying pan, which sent it back in time to the mid-1900s. Sure, let's just go with that. My favorite thing about this chapter is the potential for experimentation. If you step outside and go to Carl Franson's Photoshop, you can steal his store sign and just use that in place of the frying pan. But the coolest thing ever is that in chapter 1, where the young boy needs your help saving his grandpa, if you decline his request and walk back to the square, you'll see future Ike juggling, and he'll throw you the egg letter, and then you take it back to the bar owner who's an egg collector, and he trades you the egg for a frying pan. This means that when chapter 4 opens up, and the countdown starts ticking down before you get stabbed, you can just pull out the frying pan and literally finish the chapter in 10 seconds. That's pretty cool. One other cool detail about Chapter 4 is that if you talk to Sibylla, she expresses boredom and loneliness as a result of being confined to her house to take care of her little brother. So you offer to get her a cat after remembering Eckert's big litter of cats in the present. So you go back, ask to adopt a cat, stuff him in your inventory, and bring it back to Sibylla. She seems happy, but that cat? Not so much. This introduces a clever little grandfather's paradox, in which this cat goes back in time and becomes the great-grandfather of a bunch of future cats. The museum, which was once completely devoid of life, is now absolutely brimming with cats, as you see them chilling all around the kitchen and flopping down near the bottom of the stairs. Although that's probably incestuous, but Ike is okay with that for some reason. There's also a weird little side quest you can do at some point in one of these chapters, in which you go to the black and white time period and find out that the bar is an outdoor bar during the winter, which is a questionable business model. You talk to the bartender who gives gives you some coffee as a sort of greeting, and after you drink it, he tells you it's not free. Cunt. So now you have to pay him back somehow. Chapter 5 begins with Ike deciding to grab a bite to eat, so he heads over to the nearby bar slash restaurant before the owner recommends the special. You know this game was made in the early 2000s, because if you touched a customer on the shoulder for an extended period of time in the current year, that would be a lawsuit, at least in America. If you had the bar owner put out the fire himself in Chapter 1, his dialogue is a little more friendly. There you are. Hey, please, have a seat over there. It's, it's on the house this evening. Thanks. It's really kind of you. 
No need to be so formal. I expect you to dig right in. I'm going to get you today's special right away. As he waits for his food, Ike begins to read the alchemy book he got from Eckert earlier, which illustrates the significance of the Philosopher's Stone. And as the bar owner moves out of the way to allow some female customers to pass, a mysterious hand appears from the railing and sprinkles something onto Ike's food. He finishes reading the book, eats his meal, and leaves the bar, encountering Homunculus, who adds a little bit of exposition about the Wagner family. That's an interesting book you have there. Hmm? You want to look at it? Oh, please, don't shove that near me. I I don't like the symbol on the cover. What, this? You don't like this pentagram kind of thing? You're a little strange. Well, of course I am. In any case, I know the contents of that book. Dr. Wagner, who is mentioned in the book, had a daughter. And she's a very significant figure to you. What? Like, she's one of my ancestors? <laughs> but you see, the digipad is drawn to that age because of the link. Whatever it is. Please, don't forget the red stone. I'm looking for it too, but I believe that you are the one who is fated to acquire it. Getting your hands on it will be a step towards avoiding your own death as well. Remember that, I. Hey, I need more! Gone again. This is a really one-sided kind of relationship. Before long, he starts feeling funny, only to fall over and die from poisoning. Homunculus tells him in the void that it was a very rare poison from the female sea hare, giving him a strong hint as to what Ike should do next. I'd say that was the culprit, but you'll need to look into the details yourself. Why don't you try the library? Oops. Oops. I guess it's the art museum now. See you around. He goes back in time and convinces Alfred Broom to change the museum to a library, learns about the poison in question, and how the antidote can only be acquired in the 1500s, goes back to Margaret's time to get the antidote, travel back to the present to eat the poison food, take the antidote once he starts to feel the poison kicking in, and he's home free. All of this just to be able to eat a meal without getting poisoned instead of just sending the food back and watching to see if the killer did it again and confronting him or something. Or just eating at home, literally anything is a better alternative. Ike also witnesses a woman that looks eerily similar to Dana, but is as soon as he tries to follow her, he loses sight and returns back to Margaret. You learn in this chapter that Helena Wagner passed away while her husband is busy toiling away in the basement trying to come up with a cure, and Ike promises he'll be able to get him the Philosopher's Stone. When you come there in the original timeline, you'll encounter Homunculus, but upon seeing you greet him, he simply says, Who are you? When you time travel to 10 days before the accident, Ike has suspicions that Margaret might be his ancestress, and if you decide to tell her this, the game gives you a pretty obvious prompt to let you know that this is a decision that will change your ending permanently before letting you try again. Your age is very interesting to me. I wish I could see it. It's nothing exciting. Kind of boring, really. But I still want to see what it's like. I don't know why, but I feel such a strong pull towards it. Won't you take me to your time? No, I, I can't do that. It's not possible. The future will change. After all, you're my... Huh? You're what? Oh. Wait a sec. Did I just say something really important? What? I couldn't hear you. Hugo ends up eavesdropping and learns that you are indeed from the future, confirming his hunch, and upon Margaret asking if he's still holding onto a lock of his mother's hair, decides to have a great freakout moment that really accentuates the tone of the voice talent in this game. I know how much you miss mother, but you can't carry that thing around forever. Sh shut up! What do you mean, that thing? How could you say something like that? It's not as though I'm doing anything wrong! I'm sorry, that didn't come out quite right, but... You're the one who's being weird, changing the subject as soon as it gets a little thorny. Hugo. It's your fault. You ought to know that. Hugo. Father can't be disturbed. I know. I love that so much. He was just flipping out and borderline crying, and then he just switches to this defensive, mildly irritated, I know. As Ike tries leaving, Margaret offers him a comb, explaining it like a psychopath. 
I've had that ever since I was little. It's strange. When I touch it, I sometimes see a picture of this man in my head. He's not anyone I've met. He's much, much older, like my father's age. I have this sensation like he's patting me on the head. But it doesn't feel weird at all. Maybe I shouldn't have told you that. You must think I'm strange now. Wow, you're fucking crazy. I'm leaving now. Goodbye. I also enjoy how you can just come back anytime and repeatedly annoy her for no reason. What is it? Oh, nothing. Look, I'm really sorry, but there is someone sick upstairs, so can you be a little quieter? I have to get some more work done, too. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm going to murder you for fun. Also, if any of you guys think the name Homunculus and Philosopher's Stone sound familiar, you know where this is going. Most people on the internet have probably seen Full Metal Alchemist, which had the manga come out in the same year of 2001. But I'd be willing to wager they were both similarly inspired by the writings of Johann Wolfgang von Goth, since those two concepts are just about the only similarities the two share. Chapter 6 opens up with a really cool premise. A bunch of girls are gathered around a movie poster and decide to check it out. But upon realizing it's a movie about a man who meditates to achieve enlightenment, and that the director is a well-known hack, they back away and lose interest. A car turns on and starts racing toward Ike, running him down and killing him. Ike decides to go back to the 1970s and talk to the man who wrote the movie, only to find him praying, arms extended to the sky like he's at a Christian rock concert. He gets excited and as it turns out, he had previously seen Ike teleport and dedicated all of his time to meditate in order to summon him back. Ike essentially says, hey, that's really cool, but your movie fucking sucks and you need to change it. You have a few options, like suggesting a premise about time travel or taking over the world, giving it a love story or a thriller twist, or just leaving it completely unchanged and dying again. What a surprise. If you choose the ego poster that results from choosing world domination, the game goads you into thinking it's going to work before giving you the shaft. Hey look, it's a poster for that new movie. What's it about? A man with the power to defy time itself and covers the truth behind a grisly serial murder. That sounds pretty cool, huh? But this guy's movies are always like, huh? What, what the hell? You know. Oh yeah, that guy. If you choose one of the two time travel plots that successfully grab the girl's attention, those being the thriller, twist, or love story, more people show up and express an interest in the movie, as the camera cuts to the director celebrating before it's revealed that you're safe. All right, I've got a good feeling about this one too. Another major hit, no doubt about that, really. <laughs> Watch what you're doing! So satisfying. And I mean, who doesn't love movies about time travel? You can also take the egg watch that he gives you and take it back to the bar in the mid-1900s to pay off your bar tab. Nothing interesting happens here, but I thought it was kind of cool that I played this game a handful of times and never knew it was there. This is also the chapter in which you can save Eckert's wife. He previously alluded to his wife in a forlorn way, and it's only now that we learn she was walking her newborn baby before someone fatally shot her and made off with the baby. You can go back and try it again, at which point the description of the time period will change from a cold day to can she be saved? You can tell her that her baby is cute, or you can tell her not to go that way, both of which will have the same result of her going the same way regardless. Although complimenting her baby has a mildly different result, in which she humors your request to take another path before looking back to see that you've left and proceeding down the usual path. What an asshole. After seeing her die for the second time, the locals will notice you're acting shifty as you plan to make your getaway and attempt to reprimand you. And if you try one more time, you'll be given the opportunity to chase her through the snow like a serial killer before knocking her over and helping her dodge the bullet. Although her baby will still vanish, which I'll explain later as it has some pretty massive implications. Chapter 7 opens with Ike getting a call from Eckert, the museum uh, library owner, and oddly asks him to meet him in the bell tower. Once he gets there, he realizes he's locked inside, and upon going to the top of the building, you guessed it, he gets pushed off and falls to his death, with the most impressive scream in video game history. <laughs> 
Okay, in Scott Keck's defense, when I audition for video game roles, almost any game with combat sequences will involve you doing three light hits, three medium hits, three heavy hits, and a death noise. I find that I always have the most difficulty doing the death noise, since screaming is the least subtle thing that requires you to record. And voiceover in and of itself is all about finesse and technique. So to scream in any video game, even if you love screaming recreationally, is really awkward and vague depending on the casting director. Trust me, I voice the god of light in Ruby. I'm a professional. Please hire me. I, I really need the money, seriously. I have credit card bills. Don't need to my patron. Ike dies a mess on the pavement, and you get teleported back to the bottom of the bell tower. Decide to go to the night before. Realize that the bell tower is locked and that you can only find the key in the 70s. Steal it while Sybilla watches and doesn't say anything for some reason. Travel forward in time to the night before. Find an old rope. Tie it to the railing. Grab it just before getting pushed off the edge. And as you climb to the top, you suddenly remember that old ropes aren't as reliable as their fresher counterparts before the rope snaps and you fall to your death again. So you decide to travel back in time to the 70s, go into the bell tower, steal the new rope, go back to the night before, tie it to the railing, climb back up, and you hear Eckert ruminating about having to clean up the body. It's also interesting to note that you can take the then fresh rope, tie it to the railing in the 70s, travel to the present, use the rope, and since you let time pass naturally, it still counts as an old rope and you die again. The most annoying thing about this game is that even if you die and come back when experimenting with things, you'll still have to go back in this chapter and steal the key again in order to gain access to the bell tower, which gets really confusing until you realize that your inventory essentially resets to the beginning of the chapter. Trust me when I say that I had to redo a lot of tedious segments just to capture footage of all the different possibilities, but it's nice for the game to give you the chance to skip cutscenes you've already seen. As you confront Eckert in his office with the most awkward greeting ever given from an attempted murderer to his victim, Oh, hi. Eckert will admit that he was blackmailed by someone on the phone to kill you if he wanted to see his daughter again. Mr. Eckert, there's something I need to ask you. <sighs> I'm sorry. Truly, truly sorry. Blackmail. Our daughter went missing 20 years ago. It, it was Dana's return for your... Did you catch that? If you saved Eckert's wife in the previous chapter, she'll appear after being awoken by Eckert's voice. And if you didn't save her, he'll just mope around for a little bit. If you told Margaret about her being your ancestress, then Eckert will comment about missing his baby daughter. The comb, it somehow made me a sane man again. When I look at it, I, I feel like she's safe. When I hold it in my hand, I... I can believe that the blackmail was nothing but a piece of fiction and that my daughter is out there somewhere, happy and safe. It's as though I'm stroking her little head again, reassuring. Regardless, I think Ike's attempt to reassure Eckerd paints him as a truly selfless individual who is okay being literally murdered and still being concerned about his friend's guilty conscience. I won't make any more attempts on your life, and I plan to give myself up to the police. Forgiveness I can't ask for but I am sorry. No, that's all right. I'm still alive, and besides, it's the fault of whoever is really behind this. Please, don't blame yourself too much, Mr. Eckert. I think this was the moment I was both blown away by Ike's naivete and also sold on him being a likable character. Chapter 8 begins with Ike seeing a painting of a woman holding a red stone, and suspects it might be the Dana he left behind in the 1500s. The movie director from 2001 actually comes from a long line of artists in the past known as the Fransons, with the one in the 1500s being a painter, and the one in the 1900s being a photographer. I forgot to mention that, but there it is. Seems like everyone in this game has to follow their destiny. Ike goes back to the 1500s and heads to the Photoshop to inquire about Dana's location when Dana herself walks out. He tries to convince her to come back to the present, but she makes some odd yet sensical comments. Are you here to take me back? You know how to, don't you? Sure. Do you want to? Go back to our own time with me? I did, you know. Of course I wanted to, but not anymore. Not anymore? It's okay. I have no one there. No parents, no family. So I'll be okay here. No one will worry about me. No one expected anything of me back there. No one was watching no matter how hard I worked. So there really is nothing for me there. Don't worry about me, Ike. I'm grateful to you, you know. This world, this age. I feel like I've come home after a really long trip. That's how right it feels, and I mean that. So please, don't look for me anymore. This is where I'm going to spend my life. I've already made up my mind.
Dana gives Ike the red stone, and he goes back to Wagner's house and gives it to the doctor, who says he's going to use the stone to create an artificial life form, and tells Ike to come back in 10 days, before Ike has a flashback to the burned wreckage of the house, and warns Dr. Wagner of the danger involved. Dr. Wagner says, I don't care, lol, before explaining that he can't let Hugo find out about the creation of artificial life, or else he might plan on bringing his mother back to life. Yep, definitely drawing some more parallels here. Ike goes back upstairs to a very interesting conversation with Hugo. Hey, are you like father's right-hand man? You know, with tools from the future and stuff? Of course not. Nothing like that. Really? I'd definitely ask for your help if I were father. Then I could make a machine to move through time, like the one you showed me before. I sort of understand how it works anyway. Wow, really? I'm impressed. Well, I said sort of. He comes back in 10 days to the wreckage and hears Margaret shouting before he storms the basement and finds an elaborate time machine set to Ike's time period. As he arrives back in the present, he gets a phone call. I really enjoy the writing here, since it's interesting hearing what someone from the past would say about modern technology. Is this Hugo? Uh-huh. I really like these machines of the future. Being able to just project your voice a long distance, that's really something. How do you know my number? Oh, that. I asked someone called Eckert. You know, you mentioned him once. How did you get here, and why? Were you the one threatening Mr. Eckert? Come on, threaten sounds so serious. All I did was propose a deal. Can I help it if he jumped at the chance when I told him what he wanted to hear about his daughter? Oh, and about how I got here. It's pretty simple, really. Remember that tool you showed me? I just made one of my own, you see? Well, actually, I didn't make it, not exactly. The Hugo of the future completed it and gave it to me. A transport mechanism to time-space marked by phenomena of relevance. You like it? Just like yours. Actually, I think the other stuff may be different, but who cares, right? In any case, I can track and follow your machine. What about Margaret? Will you look at that? I'm forgetting the point of the whole thing. Can you drop by? I'll be waiting at the square. Bring homunculus. We have a few things to discuss. Oh, and by the way, do what I tell you, okay? Otherwise, someone you care about is going to die. I don't have to tell you what I need about that, right? Later. Hugo! Hey! He calls you to the square and you find him holding Margaret hostage at knife point before it dawns on Ike that he's met Hugo before earlier in the game. This is cleverly obscured by the fact that 1500's Hugo is entirely sepia, so his actual color palette being revealed in the modern day is a clever way for the game to hide his identity. If you also thought Hugo's voice sounded familiar to the boy from the burning building, you can easily chalk it up to the game's budget requiring reincorporated voice actors. Pretty well done twist. The story gets kind of fucky here, so I'll just let Hugo explain it. The homunculus was completed because you showed up. You fooled Father into creating the homunculus. Isn't that right? I read Father's research notes. They said you brought him the last ingredient, the Philosopher's Stone. What I really wanted was to get here earlier and stop what you were doing. But all my machine could do is follow yours. So I targeted yesterday's you because I thought I could manage to get to you before you did the things you did today. I had so many chances, but I still didn't manage to kill you off. Hugo. It's a shame, but there's no way for my machine to outrun yours. And I can't stop the homunculus from being completed. So I'm switching to another plan. If I can't prevent homunculus from being created in the first place, I'll destroy it. That seems to be the only way to get a hold of the Philosopher's Stone. Philosopher's Stone? What use is that to you? I know that homunculus is made of the Philosopher's Stone. If we got hold of it, we could save Mother. Save? What do you mean by that? I can save her life! That's the reason I'm looking for that stone! This time, I'll succeed, 
and she'll be alive again. We'll all go home together and start over. You understand now? Come on, go get Homunculus! He wants you to bring back Homunculus, who you managed to find leaning against a tree in the snowy 1970s, and an extremely well-written plot point is explained. Let me guess what Hugo's plan is. He's going to leave Margaret in the present and wipe you, a descendant, out that way. You knew about this? Since I was willing to give you time-traveling powers, you didn't expect me to just sit around, did you? I tested out a few histories. That particular outcome is just a variation on a theme, so it was fairly easy to guess. It's the sort of thing Hugo would think of. So I... Please, don't thank me. I just wanted to help. Switched kids. I found a baby just about the same age. <laughs> Is the Margaret you know blonde and blue-eyed? What, what are you saying? Switched babies? Isn't Margaret an ancestress of mine? Well, that's my theory. There's something uncanny about your involvement with that family, don't you think? It is, after all, the simplest explanation. Well, if she isn't a blonde, it means my plan worked. No matter what happens to Margaret, your existence is an assured fact. Don't worry, I'll switch things back to the way they were after all this is over. Switched Margaret with Mr. Eckert's daughter? So what I? No big deal, I say. She was going to die alongside her mother, and I saved her life. It's harmless compared to Hugo trying to cancel your existence by stranding Margaret in the future, don't you think? Master Hugo's plans will fail thanks to me. You now have a bunch of different choices to make depending on the ending you want. And while I'd love to show off every cutscene without interruption and give you the full scope of the outcomes and their implications, the total runtime will take about an hour. So I'm just going to go over the important bits and you can view the endings in full via the links in the video description. Endings A, B, and C are only possible if you told Margaret that she's your ancestress. And to get ending A, you have to visit Homunculus in the 70s, then go to the fortune teller's building in the present, where she'll reveal that she's actually the spirit of Helena Wagner. When Hugo tried bringing her back with his inexperienced alchemy, she comes back as a spirit, forced to haunt this mortal coil. As Ike leaves the building, he encounters Homunculus, who decides to conjure the spirit of Dr. Wagner to try and reason with him. Interestingly enough, I was able to recognize that his spell was spoken in reverse, so when I took to Premiere and tried reversing the audio, it sounded like he was repeatedly saying Kobashi Misawa. The only thing I could find about this was a boxing match in 1996 between Kenta Kobashi and Mitsuharu Misawa, which just seems like a weird throwaway gag. Japanese people really seem to enjoy random cultural references. Can you imagine if I made a game and one of the voice lines in reverse was just Madonna, Gaga, Swift? As Dr. Wagner approaches Hugo and scolds him for trying to kill Ike, he tells Hugo he can come with him to learn the truth of why he did what he did, and as they begin to vanish, Margaret catches on to the ruse. Father? That isn't my father. What? Homunculus explains that he can't conjure up Dr. Wagner since he's not actually dead which he refuses to elaborate on for reasons which will soon become incredibly apparent. Homunculus asks for his digipad back, and in the process, Ike turns into a silly little Butterfingers and drops the device, which causes Homunculus to start melting like the Wicked Witch and cease to exist. Cut to some time later, and Margaret is living happily in the present day. As it turns out, she was adopted by the Eckerts, who don't realize they're actually biologically related. Ike notices the tree he had removed earlier is back, and upon reaching inside of the tree, he mysteriously finds the Philosopher's Stone. 
And that concludes ending A. Interestingly enough, while this is supposed to be the best ending, it's actually not terribly interesting compared to the others. Ending B actually has two different variations. You either talk to the homunculus or the fortune teller, but not both. Talking exclusively to the fortune teller gets you ending B1, in which Ike tells Hugo about his mother's spirit. And as Hugo enters the building, it begins crumbling as Helena refuses to forgive her son for being a murderer. And he allows himself to die, thinking that he's going to be reunited with his mother because he's a fucking idiot. Ike returns Margaret to what she believes is her original time period, and then goes to the bar to get a drink. That's literally it. Ending B2 has you talking exclusively to Homunculus, and then going back to the square, at which point Ike, realizing Margaret isn't actually his ancestress, taunts Hugo into leaving her in the present, knowing it won't actually erase his lineage. As this happens, Eckert sneaks up and Solid Snake grapples Hugo and delivers the most epic dad speech of all time. Stop it! No way! You won't get away from me as long as you're after... Ike! Help! Sis! Hugo, stop this! Please, I'm begging you to stop! See that? You've got family of your own, and you don't treat family that way. And Ike? He has people he cares about, too. Don't you ever forget it. I feel the same way about my family. You think there's a parent worth his salt out there who doesn't care about his children? You understand what I'm saying? I'm someone's parent and you're someone's child. So I'm telling you, end this right here, right now. Even if you keep trying, I won't let you do it. You understand? Promise me you'll end this. Okay. Come on, sis. Let's go home. When we get there, I promise I'll destroy the time-traveling device. What? Seems a shame. It's my way of making amends and turning over a new leaf. Time travel, you say? Yes, this is normal. Hugo and Margaret return to the 1500s. Eckert comments about Margaret reminding him of his kidnapped daughter, and then Ike goes to the bar to get a drink. Ending C is essentially the funny ending, and fun fact, was the one I originally got at the end of my first ever blind playthrough. After speaking to Hugo in the square, you go back to the 1500s with the intention of burning Dr. Wagner's research notes, and in the process Ike hears someone coming and hides, only to witness Hugo and Margaret searching for their missing father shortly after the explosion. Hugo sulks about his father's selfishness before a crazy machine appears in the middle of the room, revealing future Hugo, who begins to explain everything to him. I'd summarize this all myself, but it's an interesting cutscene, and I also want you to hear this fucking Microsoft Sam voice for yourself. Hugo, dry your tears. Uh, who, who are you? Never mind that. I am giving you this machine. What is... The same as the one in the possession of the man you know, a time-traveling mechanism. However, this one is only capable of following his trail. Be aware of that. You're giving this to me? Use it. Use it to stop that man, that Ike. As Ike reveals himself to expose future Hugo's lies, he panics and tries to run, encountering Margaret in the process, whom he threatens to hit with his cane. As we learned earlier in the game, making physical contact with yourself is a big time travel logic no-no. So when Hugo tries to stop geriatric Hugo from hitting his sister, they're both wiped out by a time paradox before Margaret promptly passes out from shock. And everyone lived happily ever after. Not really. Ike returns to the present and gives Homunculus back his digipad, and as he lays in the square and reflects on how beautiful life is, well, I'll just let you watch it for yourself. All the stars up there. I must be lucky. I know how beautiful it is to be alive. Right on, dude. So it's like, join the club. I heard this rock and roll. Catch you later, dude. You're gonna like get run over or something if you stay there.
God damn it, man number one and man number two. I knew you couldn't be trusted. Endings D and E are both unlocked when you abstain from telling Margaret about your ancestry. If you choose not to ask Dana to come back to the present, it triggers a slightly different conversation when you hand off the Philosopher's Stone to Dr. Wagner. Uh, sir, I just thought of something. What is it? M maybe you should draw a, a pentagram or something for protection, just in case. It is a dangerous experiment, after all. I will certainly do so. I thank you for your concern. Later, when Hugo is holding Margaret hostage in the square, Ike can go back and successfully burn Dr. Wagner's research notes, which leads to Hugo being unable to read them. And since he never learns the truth about his father's research and therefore never decides to come after Ike for helping him find the Philosopher's Stone, Hugo fades away, with Margaret following not long after. We flash back to Dr. Wagner as he attempts to create the homunculus, and upon doing so learns that the homunculus is actually a genie who can grant him whatever wish he wants. He realizes he's wasted his life learning how to create a cure for his wife's illness, and wishes is to have eternal youth, so he can get more time with which to start again. As he grants Dr. Wagner his wish, we see his young silhouette interacting with the genie, and his voice sounds strikingly familiar. Am I? Did it really work? Trust me, okay? You got exactly what you wished for. Your work here is done. It's back to where you came from, demon. Pentagram. It's no great art to get rid of the likes of you, but I was well advised to ready an additional barrier. Return to the stone from whence you came, and I will start my research and my life from the beginning. You, you, damn it, you'll pay for this? No pentagram is completely. Yep, you guessed it. Ike is actually an alternate version of Dr. Wagner, who suffers from memory loss and is cursed to wander all of time with no recollection of who he is, where he's from, or where he's going. This is actually hinted at earlier in the game, when Ike first meets Margaret's family, with Helena commenting, My, your friend's voice is remarkably like your father's. And it also dawned on me that Ike never makes physical contact with Dr. Wagner, only handing him items by placing them on a table for him to pick up. This is the one ending that's actually, in a sense, the true ending, since it loops back around to explain Ike's very existence. And even though it's the D-rank ending, most Shadow of Destiny fans feel like this is one of the better endings. Ending E, which is the last one, is a bit of a weird one. In this one, Ike doesn't tell Margaret about their lineage, and gets the option to ask Dana to come back to the present. She becomes understandably emotional, and blames Ike for leaving her there, only to have her abandon the new life that she's cultivated, and asks him to say goodbye to her boss in the present. Upon arriving at the diner, he finds a little note under the door thanking Dana for her hard work, calling her a close friend. When he brings the note back to her in the 1500s, she has a change of heart and decides to come back home, especially once Ike tells her that only a few hours have passed in their original time, meaning she hasn't missed a day of work despite having aged four years in the 1500s. He brings her back and she insists on walking home alone, and as Ike gets the call from Hugo, it's revealed that he has Dana held hostage instead of Margaret. I need help. Hugo, do you have someone with you? <laughs> Absolutely. A friend of yours, I think. I saw you two talking. Look pretty cozy to me, but it was sheer luck that I ran into her in the future. Dana! What are you doing with Dana? Well, that's up to you. I'm asking you to do me a favor. Bring Homunculus with you. We'll be waiting in the square. Don't keep me waiting, all right? He meets with Hugo in the square per usual, and decides to go back to the 1500s to ask for Margaret's help. And when she sees her brother, she isn't even remotely phased by the knife as she just slaps him across the face and scolds him, before telling him she can try to fill the void left over by their mother. It may be just the two of us, but we're still a family, and we have a place to go back to. But... I'll... I'll take care of 
you. And you take care of me, okay? What I make working will keep us both fed and clothed. I can try to be more like Mother was to us. <laughs> Sis, you don't care anymore that Mother's gone. Look, both of us are old enough to stand on our own two feet, Hugo. We have to take responsibility for our own actions, right? Okay. I'll go home. He agrees and they both return home, before an incredibly awkward conversation ensues, especially once he realized that Ike is a young Dr. Wagner and Dana is originally Dr. Wagner's daughter, making her his biological daughter. Well, since you brought it up, I should mention something. You're like a nice dad. I don't remember mine. And you're too young to be one, but that's how I seem. Oh, do I seem that ancient? No, nothing like that. It's all this talk about responsibility. And besides, you seem so with it and everything. <laughs> okay, I'll walk you home, just in case. That'd be nice. I don't want to deal with that again. Come on, Dad. Come on yourself. If you call me that again, you can walk alone. <laughs> I think I read a dojin like this once. And with that, the game is over. Except, once you return to the title screen, the music has completely changed in tone and complexity. If you start a new game after unlocking every ending, you'll be given different dialogue options that will trigger new content. In the beginning, Ike normally says, Am, am I dead? To which Homunculus responds with, Bingo. Bingo. Ike will then subsequently say, Who, Who's there? But on this run, you'll be interrupted with a dialogue box saying, Am I dead? Again? After Homunculus speaks, Ike can say, Oh, Homunculus. Aside from that, the game begins as usual, except Ike behaves with the sentience of someone who's done this many times, initially by checking under his chair for anything he left behind. Later, when he meets with a fortune teller who has no recollection of meeting him, he flat out speaks to her like it's just an average Tuesday. I'm going to find a red stone soon. It's probably the Philosopher's Stone. That thing. If I use it, then Homunculus... No, don't utter the name of that cursed abomination. Who knows if he might be listening. All right. I'll make up my own mind about what to do with the stone. How's that sound? After leaving the fortune teller building, he stops by his future juggler self before commenting, Hey, that's me. Even I can do that. Wait, no, don't! And as he gets tossed the Scribner's egg, he reads aloud an entirely different message. The red stone is the Philosopher's Stone, and the source of Homunculus's life. It's also the main element in the elixir of life, which is supposed to cure all diseases. Realizing the significance of the stone to his mission, he goes back to the diner and tracks down Dana to find the stone. Shortly after, he goes to the burning building and, realizing the little kid's identity as being Hugo, stops himself from revealing that information. Hey, Hugh! Uh, I mean... <laughs> he goes inside the burning building and instead of dying outright, he has the opportunity to jump time periods, which marks the first time voiceover is ever included over the digipad interface. Instead of being able to go back to the previous day like the original timeline, he can now only travel to Margaret's time. Interestingly enough, I died here the first time without realizing I had to go back to the diner and get the stone from Dana, and Ike hints at the player to do so. I get it. It's no good without that stone. The red stone. Oh, no. <coughs> and when you die, something is missing. Normally, Homunculus speaks to you in his realm, but this time he's strangely absent. When you teleport back to the 1500s, everything proceeds normally, as he meets Margaret and defends her from the shriveled hags. And as she invites him back to her place, he interrupts his meeting with Helena and Hugo to step away as he joins Margaret in meeting with her father, who is unresponsive per usual. Ike pulls out the Philosopher's Stone and tells Margaret to give it to her father, before giving him a set of very specific instructions. If you take a chip from that stone and brew it, you can make the elixir, the cure-all. 
Your wife will be cured for sure. Ah, uh, this, this is the... It's the real thing. Brew it as soon as possible, please. I... I thank you. Please, it's okay. I'll be going now. With that, he promptly exits, having completed his mission, as we see Helena drink the elixir, while Margaret and Hugo watch gleefully, occasionally cutting out sight to Ike as he begins to feel uneasy. Before long, he fades out of existence, and the credits roll. Alternatively, if Ike chooses to teleport back to the present before coming to Margaret's house, he'll return to the fire, subsequently die of smoke inhalation, and appear in Homunculus's realm before this exchange occurs. Th the stone! So, 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 it was too difficult after all to challenge change. Hey, there's something I want to ask you. Yes, what might that be? I need to show you this. Oh, what a bother. I wanted to wait till later to make my appearance. It's this, this stone. It wants to go home! I did it! These endings are known as EX-1, regarded as a happier ending, and EX-2. We're left with a final cutscene in which a modern-day Ike donning more contemporary clothing speaks to some friends before leaving and waving goodbye. He's seen in a similar situation to the prologue cutscene, in which he, of course, gets stabbed to death. But this time there's a twist. We see Hugo having kicked his soccer ball into Ike's back as a silly subversion of expectations, and as Ike picks up the soccer ball to return it to him, he ruffles his hair before he's on his way, and with that, the Book of Shadow of Destiny closes for good. This ending is a little bit confusing at first, so allow me to explain. Ike, the character as we know him, was created as a result of Dr. Wagner wanting eternal youth, and mixed with his amnesia and ability to skip time, created a sort of alternate Dr. Wagner that became known as Ike. We're not sure who named him that or how we ended up living in the modern age, but we know that Homunculus made him to ensure he would go on to do his bidding and preserve his creation. In all the other endings, Ike either continued to exist to do whatever, or he simply died. But the game effectively restarts every time you reach the ending, as Homunculus owns Dr. Wagner soul and will use him to ensure his creation, regardless of any meddling Hugo or Ike try to interject. In this final ending, Ike either throws the Philosopher's Stone, which was the origin of Homunculus, back into him, and causing him to cease existence resulting from a time paradox, or he helps Dr. Wagner cure Helena's disease, thus preventing him from trying to bring her back to life after her death, meaning Homunculus would never be created, and he would never give Dr. Wagner eternal youth resulting in Ike's creation, effectively eliminating his need to exist in the first place. This means the Ike and Hugo that we see in the final cinematic are more than likely descendants of the Wagner family, showing a more peaceful future for both characters. In 2008, when I was in college and found out that the original writer, Junko Kawano, made a spiritual successor known as Time Hollow, I bought it immediately and was incredibly let down. On top of being an over-the-top anime style that didn't feel anything like Shadow of Destiny, it was ridiculously linear with the game holding your hand the entire way through. So as we know it, Shadow of Destiny was just a one-off game with no chance of a sequel. But maybe that's for the best. These days, if an old game gets a reboot or a sequel, it often isn't the best news to receive. So I'm happy with it echoing in the annals of history as an interesting niche little game without some modern corporation trying to make a quick cash grab and ruining the legacy it introduced. I really enjoyed this game when I was a kid, and I like a lot of the concepts it tries to pull off. 
independent of the goofy voice acting and occasional plot holes, I think this game might be one of the only story-first games I really, truly adore. I guess you could technically call it a walking simulator, but the plot more than makes up for that detail. I love the reckless nature of just being able to go back in time and change whatever you want in an attempt to preserve your ability to remain alive, and I'd love to see more games that tackle these subjects in an interesting, open-ended way that movies and TV shows just can't pull off. In short, this is an amazing game, and I'm glad it exists. Hey, so I heard you were talking shit about my voice. Oh, hey, Ike. No, I, I was just saying it was kind of funny, that's all. You must think I was born yesterday, huh? No, no, of course not. I love your voice. It was really charming. Oh, Chase Face, you silly little bitch. I can travel through time on a whim, and you think I can't tell when I'm being disrespected? Please, I, I swear, it wasn't like that. I, I really like your voice and delivery, and that scream was really good. For your sake, I hope you believe in God. <laughs>